Uh, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 7. This is good news. This is good news. Uh, last, last week we studied the first eight verses where the 12,000 from each tribe of Israel were sealed with the seal of God in their forehead. And so now we get to what happens after God seals the 144,000 Jewish virgin males. Now you say, now, where did you get that they're Jewish virgin males? Okay, well, let's take a look at Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14. In the YouTube sermons, uh, you will find an arrow on the right-hand side of the screen, and it'll be pointing down to a smaller arrow. And if you'll click on that arrow, all the notes for this teaching will come up. And that arrow will flash, but after you click the, and find the notes, that arrow will disappear. And then you can not only watch and listen to the sermon, but you can also study the notes with us. And it describes the 144,000. Surprisingly enough, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> but they are witnesses for Jehovah. <laughs> okay. Revelation 14 and verse 1 says, and this is John speaking, John the Apostle, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion. Now remember, Mount S-I-O-N, Sion is in heaven. Mount Zion, Z, is on earth. Okay, so Mount Sion is the heavenly mount up in heaven. It says, I saw a hundred, and with him were a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So we studied that last week. But this describes who they are. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping their harps. And they sung, as it were, these 144,000, they sung a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but only the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are those who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. And they are those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So to explain this, 144,000 Jewish virgin males, 12,000 from each tribe, which God sought out on the earth, and sealed them so they could witness to the Jews who were left when we get caught up to be with the Lord. That's why God always has a witness on the earth. He seals 144,000. After they're killed, you see them in Revelation 14, they're redeemed from the earth, which means they died. Okay, Once they're gone, then God sends two witnesses. And those two witnesses have power to bring plagues and all kinds of things upon the earth. Once they kill those two witnesses, after three days, those two, and we'll be studying all this in the book of Revelation, those two witnesses rise up into heaven. It's actually a double resurrection. And then after that, a mighty angel flies through the heavens preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the end comes. So God never leaves the earth without a witness. But all of us will be gone, as we're going to see here in Revelation chapter 7, starting with verse 9. And we'll read through verse 17. So John says, after this, and remember, this is the sealing of 144,000. After the 144,000 were sealed, I saw a great multitude which no man could number. They were from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And they stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and they had palms in their hands. What does that remind you of in the Bible? How about when Jesus came into Jerusalem and the people were waving palms? Amen. So you got the earthly picture of Christ entering into Jerusalem, people waving palms and crying, Hosanna, blessed be the Lord. Amen. So when we get to heaven, it's the same picture, only a heavenly picture, into the new Jerusalem, waving palms and crying these words here. The scripture says, crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits upon the throne 
and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne. All is a lot. Remember, God's angels are thousands and ten thousands times thousands. So many angels. How do they all fit around the throne? And about the elders and the four beasts, and they all fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. They said, Amen, and blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So there's going to be great elation, great rejoicing, great praise when we get to heaven. And then in verse 13, one of those 24 elders asked John, Who are these who were arrayed or dressed in the white robes? Where do they come from? Now, it doesn't take a lot of thought to know that they weren't there before. That elder has been there the whole time John's there. They've never been mentioned. And all of a sudden, this elder said, Who are these people dressed in the white robes? Where do they come from? And John answers in verse 14 and says, Sir, you know. And the elder said to him, these are those which came out of great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now let me put it down in our common language, okay? These are those that came away from great trouble which was happening on the earth. They have washed their robes, they've been born again and become their sins are white now because of the blood of the Lamb. These are the people that accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. These are the people who believed in the blood of Jesus Christ, who believed in the death, burial, and the resurrection. That's us. John saw us in heaven way before we ever get there. And the scripture says that we are now seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Now, we're already there. Okay, verse 15. They will be before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne will dwell among them. They will hunger no more. Neither will they thirst any more. Neither will the sun light on them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the middle of the throne will feed them and will lead them unto the fountains of waters. And God will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And I just want to remind you Hunger no more means somebody was hungry. Thirsty no more means somebody got thirsty. Wipe away all of our tears means we had some tears. Amen? Okay, so let's go, let's go back. Let's take a look. Verse 9. Notice this is the first mention of the church, the called out ones in heaven in verse 9. In verse 9 he says, I saw a great multitude which no man could number from all nations and people and tongues. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. So the word meta in the Greek means associated with. So we are all together, not separated. That's what the Greek word means. Is all the nations have now, all the Christians are now in unity. Instead of being split up in little denominations <laughs> everywhere, all those walls have been broken down and we're all together now before the Lord. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 12. Luke, the 12th chapter. So this is the great promise that God has given us that someday, and I don't know when, I hope it's soon, we're all going to be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. That's great news for us. That's really bad news for everybody else that didn't accept Jesus Christ. Woe, woe, woe is in chapter 8 unto those who are left on the earth. That's why I beg people so often, come to Jesus while you still have a chance. Come to Christ. Give your life to Christ. Get saved. Believe in Jesus. Don't be caught and left behind. Okay? So Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 34. The Bible says where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. 
Let your loins be girded about and let your lights be burning. Remember, we're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 36. And you yourselves be like men that are waiting for their Lord. When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. Now, I'll just remind you what Luke 21 says. We won't go there, but it says, Pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my Lord is delaying his coming. So he begins to eat and be drunk and beat his fellow servants. Well, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he is not expecting him. And he will cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I thank God there'll be no weeping and gnashing of teeth in heaven. But there's going to be plenty of it on the earth. And that's why we're so concerned with people accepting Christ as their Savior. So in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 10, the scripture says, We cry with a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne. So all all of us who stand on heaven's throne room floor appear to be very excited about salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's one thing to receive a promise, but it's another thing to see it and live it. Okay? The Bible says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the promise comes, it is like a tree of life. So um, how, do, how do you relate that? I guess as a little boy, uh, my dad would come to Utah once or twice a year to visit us from Arizona. My parents were separated when I was young. And we would, we would say, okay, it's almost Christmas. He's coming. And there were a couple of times he didn't show. And so we had all this hope, and it was during Christmas time, you know, and we're waiting for him to come, and he didn't show. And that made our heart sick. But if he came a week later, then we were glad. So right now the Lord is delaying some things. I'm not God. I don't know why. But I know what God said, and I know what God says in the scripture, and I know what God says about himself. Numbers twenty three nineteen. The Lord is not like a man that he would lie. Neither is the son of man so that he would repent. Has he said and shall he not do it? Has he spoken and shall it not come to pass? Hebrews six eighteen says it's impossible for God to lie. And Titus chapter one verse two says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised us before the world began. So I don't know timing on a lot of things, but I know what God says. I know what God says. And you know, I can go back to my illustration about when I lost my job and my house was repossessed and then auctioned. Just about everybody in my men's Bible study thought I was crazy. And I mean, it got to the last week and we even had people leave the Bible study because I told them, God told me not to move. God's going to save this house. I don't know how. I don't have any money to save it, but I know God's going to save it. And it was the day before at 10 minutes to 5 in the afternoon that God saved our house. The next day, the sheriff was coming. So I see that God always gets the glory and doesn't allow man to put his little mitts in there and fix it himself. So the teaching I have uh, for really for this Sunday and our uh, bulletin says, wait on the Lord. And you know how much we like to wait in America. We just love to wait. You know, you ever go to Costco for gas? That's really fun. They have these little green lights up there that when the green light is, it means that pump is empty and you can pull up and get gas. And people will sit there and they they won't get it. And I've gotten out of my car, I don't know, 20 times and walked up and said, excuse me, see the little green light up there? That means that pump's empty. You can go right up in there and get gas. And people are like, oh, and then they pull around and get gas. It's amazing to me. Duh. Green means go. Red means stop. 
The light's either red or green. It's unbelievable to me. So all of us who stand on heaven's throne room floor appear to be very excited about salvation through Christ, as we should be. Because the Bible says in Psalm 16, verse 11, God has shown us the pathway to life. In his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I mean, it is like walking into the chocolate factory times a thousand. You, every kind of chocolate imaginable, if you've never been there, go to Pismo to the outlets, man. They got chocolate in there that'll, you start dripping, you know? You gotta, <laughs> gotta wipe your mouth. It, heaven's gonna be a thousand times, a million times more exciting than that. Now, I'm trying to give you some illustrations on earth so, so that you'll understand that fullness of joy. Okay, so here's an experiment you can do at your house. Take a glass of water and fill it up and then set it on the counter and ask whoever's in the house, is this glass full? And they'll look at it and go, yeah, it's full. Say, no, it's not. And then you pull out a turkey baster and you get some water and you put more water in it till it comes almost to the rim. And you say, is it full now? And they'll always say, oh, pff, it's full. Say, no, it's not. And then you take a dropper and you continue to drop. You can get about 50 more drops once it's there. And you'll actually see the water come up over the edge, but it won't go over. And the last drop that you can put in there that makes it go over, the drop before is when the glass is full. And God says you'll have fullness of joy. In other words, if there was one more drop of joy, you would just fall to the ground. It's going to be fullness of joy. You can't add any more joy to that. It's the fullest joy you've ever felt in your life. You'll be elated. And then pleasures forevermore. And I always pay attention to the S words because it's plural. Pleasures. How many pleasures can you think of? God says forevermore. Every kind of pleasure you can imagine. I imagine the fruit tree. Just the tree that's on both sides of the uh, river of life. What if some of that fruit tastes like ice cream? It says it has 12 different kinds of fruit every month. Different kinds. So that's just one of the pleasures that we'll have in heaven is eating. Didn't Jesus say we'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb? We're going to be able to eat. And then our mind figures will... Will we gain weight? What? No, it's heaven. You can eat as much as you want of anything. Like I'm starting with ice cream first. And I just do everything backwards. But I'm telling you, heaven is unexplainable. God, God explains it this way in 1 Corinthians 2.9. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared. For those who love him. We can't even imagine how wonderful it is. And man, can we not wait for that day just a few minutes longer. So look at verse 11 and 12 with me. So what are we going to do when we get to heaven? All right, well, verses 11 and 12 clearly show that the activity in heaven is worship. We're going to worship. We're going to fall on our face and we are going to worship God like we've never worshipped God before. And it is going to be amazing. And nobody's going to look at us funny because we're all going to be lifting up our voices to the heavens as loud as we possibly can. And we're going to be worshipping the Lord. So here's a preview of that. If you'll turn with me to Psalm, the book of Psalm 150, the last Psalm, 150. Right before the book of Proverbs, Psalm 150. These aren't suggestions, these are commandments. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary, which is what we're going to be doing. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. 
Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him on the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Remember that? Well, maybe you didn't teach Sunday school, all of you, but praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Remember that? Praise God. Hallelujah. Verses 13 and 14. This elder walks up to John, one of the 24 elders, and he says, who are these people? Where did they come from? Well, they're the ecclesia. That's a Greek word for church, which means the called out ones. I mean, God couldn't get any plainer, but to use the Greek word that means the called out ones. Well, if you're called out, you've got to be in first. Okay, so you've got to be a believer and you have to be in the earth and God's going to call us out. So Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, it says we're from all nations on the earth. So let's look at the word out of, because remember it says they came out of great tribulation. So if you look the word out of in Strong's Concordance, it's one simple word. It's a Greek word, E-K. We get our word exit from it. So what does it mean literally in the Greek? It doesn't mean come out of the middle of. It means come away from. And what did it say? We came away from great tribulation. It didn't say the great tribulation. It said great tribulation. In other words, trouble. Is there any trouble in the land? Oh, okay. So we're having trouble. And then God says that's enough. Time to go because I'm ready to pour down my trouble, which we'll be studying next week in Revelation chapter 8. And when God's trouble comes, we're gone. But when God trouble comes down on the earth, woe, woe, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth who are left behind. That's what scripture says in Revelation chapter 8. So this word is defined in Strong's Concordance as out before or away from or preceding. So thus the scripture clearly points out that the called out ones, the church, we exit just prior to the great wrath of God, which starts the great tribulation period. And that is to be proven out in the following two chapters, chapter 8 and 9. So don't miss those studies. Be here next week and the following as we study chapter 8 and chapter 9 so that you can see John sees all these people. The elder says, where did they come from? And the scripture describes where they came from, from all nations of the earth and all people and all tongues and all nations. And so where did this great group come from? And I've had some Bible teachers say, well, it's clear they came out of the great tribulation. Duh, the great tribulation doesn't even start till chapter 9. How can they come out in chapter 7 if, if it doesn't even start till chapter 9? That's like saying, well... I started the car, but then I walked out to the car and unlocked it. How do you start the car without getting in it first? And that accepts all 2018s and above, because now you can push a button, I know. <laughs> so the scripture clearly points out that the church exits just prior to the wrath of God and the great tribulation, which we'll prove in the next couple of chapters. But let's take a look at the word ek, or away from. In 1 Thessalonians, does the Bible teach that Christians will not go through the wrath of God? Does the Bible teach that? So let's take a look. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. So the, the Thessalonians, uh, the book of Thessalonians, found about two-thirds of the way through your New Testament. All the T's are together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. Let's start with verse 9. It'll put it in context. For they themselves show us of what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you returned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. That's every one of us. 
We all had some kind of idol in our life before we got saved. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's pretty plain. You can't twist that. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay, now let's take another verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. Because God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The word salvation means deliverance. God's going to deliver us away from his wrath into heaven just before he pours his wrath down. Okay, let's, let's look at some more. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. So you've got to turn to your left. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's start with verse 9. 2 Corinthians 1 verse, verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raises the dead. Amen? Amen. Verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Do we trust that? Do we believe that God is going to deliver us? You say, but... But look around. I mean, listen to the news. Look at what's going on. Well, you've got to have a great disaster before you have a great deliverance. Remember, I preached that on Sunday. You've got to have the Red Sea. You've got to have Jericho. You've got to have the Amalekites. You've got to have a problem. You've got to have Goliath. You've got to have a big issue before God does the deliverance. So in verses 15 through 17... Let's go back to Revelation chapter 7. The Bible says, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits in his temple, or he that sits on the throne, will dwell among them. So how how awesome is that? That Jesus, even though he lives among us now, because where two or three of us are gathered together in his name, he's right here. But then we're going to be able to see him to touch him, to talk with him, and, and, and get a verbal answer back. It's going to be amazing. Verse 16, We will hunger no more, thirst no more, neither will the sun light on us or any heat, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne will feed us. He will lead us to the fountains of living waters, and God will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, remember what Jesus said? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Even to the very great white throne where the unsaved dead are judged, God is with us even there. And then Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says, Let your conversation or your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never, never leave you or forsake you, so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not be afraid what man shall do unto me. Actually, they should be afraid of what God is going to do to them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So let's uh, turn our notes over. And by the way, I want to remind those who are listening on YouTube uh, on the YouTube sermon, when you pop it up, there's a drop-down box. It'll have an arrow on the right-hand side of the screen. If you'll click that drop-down box, all the notes of this message will appear right on the YouTube video, and you can follow along with us on those notes. Now, that's something we just added recently. And that arrow will go away. It'll flash a few times so it shows you where the drop-down box is. You just push that button, all the notes pop up, And then it'll disappear. So let's talk about Revelation chapter 7. This chapter reveals that at the same time there was a great earthquake, and that was in Revelation chapter 6, God begins sealing 144,000 Jewish witnesses on this earth. 
And then we studied who are the witnesses. They're Jewish virgin males. Okay? So they get sealed. During that same approximate time period, Christ lifts us, the believers, off the earth into heaven, which the Apostle John and the angel speaking to him witness as that event happens right in front of their eyes. So let me remind you of a couple of places in Scripture. I've got them here, and I'm just going to summarize. The Bible says, do you believe in God? The Scripture says, then believe in God also. He doesn't want us to be ignorant about his coming. He says he's going to come to the clouds, and with the voice of a trumpet, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. The dead bodies are going to come out and rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up, will all be caught up together with them into the clouds, into the air, where we will always be with the Lord. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we're all going to be changed. In other words, there'll be some of us left that are alive and remain. Not everybody's going to be killed or fall asleep or die. Some of us are going to be left. And the scripture says, we, this mortal, this mortal body that we have must put on immortality. This corruptible body that we have has to put on incorruption. And when that happens, that'll bring the saying to pass that says, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? So God says we'll be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound. So that's that whole teaching about us being caught up. Now keep in remembrance, even though the earth has seen plenty of trouble, we've seen plenty already. We're going to see a lot more. I don't know how much more, but I know if you went to Africa, they probably think they're already in the tribulation. If you went to North India, you would definitely have people tell you, I think the tribulation period has started now. I mean, people are being slaughtered all over the globe. And now we're being threatened. Although the earth has seen plenty of trouble, the great tribulation is God's great wrath. It hasn't started yet. That occurs in Revelation chapter 8 through chapter 18. So as soon as we are caught up for 10 chapters, God's wrath falls on the earth. And there's 14 judgments that happen throughout those 10 chapters. 14. 14 different things happen. We'll be studying those. The first one is that a great star falls from heaven to earth. And then out of this pit of smoke, wherever this pit is, out of the pit of smoke come forth all these demonized locusts that have body armor on them. They have faces. They actually have faces that look like men's faces. And they have hair that's similar to, to women's hair. And they have stingers. They have tails in their, and they have stingers in their tails. And they're going to be tormenting men for five months. And in those days, men will seek death and they won't be able to find it. They won't be able to die. And you can imagine the pain that people are going to go through. Some people are going to lose it and they're going to jump off the top of a building, but they won't be able to die. They're going to throw themselves in front of any vehicle that's coming and they won't be able to die. People are going to jump and try to kill themselves. It will not happen. Can you imagine people that try to hang themselves or shoot themselves or some other way to kill themselves, they won't die. God says, I won't let anybody die for five months. So during that time, then 120-pound rocks come out of the heaven to the sky. Now, I will say this. If you get shot with a 230-grain bullet from a 45 auto, you're going to die. That's coming at you uh, from, from, a, from a firearm. Can you imagine 120-pound rocks falling from heaven, what are your chances of surviving? If you're in a concrete building, that's going to go right through the concrete building. It, they're going to fall, and doesn't the scripture say that? The stars of heaven will fall. That's what the Bible says. And then all the green grass will be burned up on the earth. And one third of the trees, that's our oxygen. That's where we get our oxygen from. It's all going to be burned up. What happens when you burn things? There's smoke in the air. So people are going to have to breathe smoke. 
And then God sends boils and plagues. So much so that the Bible says in Revelation 16 verse 11, they'll bite their tongues for pain. They'll chew on their tongues. Man, I did that the other day. That really hurts. That's something you don't really want to repeat. You know, you're just so hungry, you take a big bite and oh, like that. It's like, oh, okay, I got to take smaller bites. It hurts. The Bible says they're going to be chewing on their tongues for the pain. And then God says he's going to smite them with great heat. And when, when he does, people will blaspheme God because of the great heat. That's only seven of them. There's these horses that have fire that come out of their mouth. And they have tails like horses have tails, but their tails are snakes. So as fire's coming out and scorching people, the snake heads are coming around and biting them from the other end. All of these things. And why? Why does God do this? God does this to see if he can squeeze out the last grapes on the earth. He does this in incremental judgment. And it's almost like God is saying, will you come now? Will you come now? No. How about now? All right. Send the fiery horses. How about now? No. Okay, how about the boils? Nope, not then either. God is trying to squeeze out the last people on earth who will receive him as Lord and Savior. So although the word rapture isn't found in the scripture, neither is the word Bible found in the scripture. The word biblios means books. Okay, we call this the Bible. You're not going to find one thing anywhere that says Bible in here. Okay, it's just, it's the Greek word that means books, 66 of them. So even though the word rapture isn't technically in the Bible, is this teaching found in Scripture? Is the rapture found? There's some preachers that will say, absolutely not. It's an escapism doctrine that was founded in the 1700s. I tell them, well, you're well on your way to get a reprobate mind. It is in so many scriptures in the Bible, it's not even funny. So let's take a look at a few of them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we have time to do this now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with verse 11. You are to study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your hands as we commanded you so that you can walk honestly towards those who are unsaved, those who are outside the household of faith, so that you can have lack of nothing. Verse 13. But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, or uninformed is a better word. I don't want you to be uninformed concerning those who have died or fallen asleep, that you should not sorrow as others who have no hope. It was funny when I, when I, uh, I have a friend who I spoke with and she said, I really don't get it why we try to keep people out of heaven. I <laughs> said, so what do you mean? She says, man, we pray for people who are sick. Oh God, please heal them. Don't let them, don't let them die. Don't let them. Well, they're going to heaven. We pray more for people to stay out of heaven than we do pray for people to stay out of hell. It's crazy. If God's going to call him into heaven, hallelujah. Praise God. Even the Greek priest noticed when my dad died, all my brothers and my sister were weeping. I had nothing to weep about. I was rejoicing, man. I got to lead my dad to Jesus two weeks before he died. Even the Greek priest noticed and he said, I noticed your family's all just falling apart here. Why aren't you? And I said, he's not there. He's in heaven. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's not here. That's not him. And he said, wow, what do you base that upon? And so I shared these scriptures with him. That you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. Because if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so those who are sleeping Jesus, God will bring them with him. Wait a minute, if God brings them with him, they got to be there, right? If God's coming from heaven and he brings them with him, then he's bringing them from heaven with him. You can find that in Revelation chapter 6, by the way, where the souls under the altar cry out to God and say, How long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood on this earth? 
So God's going to bring those who have fallen asleep with him. Your sister's coming back with Jesus. Helen, Helen's coming back. Steve, your husband, my buddy, he's coming back. He's coming back. Dwayne, your son, he's coming back with Jesus. He's coming back. Isn't that exciting? Amen. This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What does that mean, the dead in Christ? Well, if they're with him, who are they? That's the dead bodies. That's the bodies that we put in the ground. That's the ashes that were spread at sea. That's the people, I, I heard this story once, there's a guy in World War II got his arm blown off in France and they couldn't find it. Then he moved to Virginia and he had to have a leg amputated because of a war wound. Then he moved to California and that's where he died. And so when the rapture comes, his arm's coming out of France, his leg's coming out of Virginia, and his body's coming out of California in a twinkling of an eye and be made incorruptible and he'll go up. Isn't that amazing? Say, how does God do that? How does God do anything? He made the whole earth out of nothing. You think God can raise a few particles of dust? Then we, after the dead in Christ, rise to meet their living spirits that are coming with Jesus, then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them into the clouds. I, li I like what God does here. I mean, we know where the clouds are. But then he says, yeah, in the air. <laughs> and so shall we always be with the Lord. He's trying to say, we're going up. We're going up. I'm trying to make this plane in the clouds, in the air. And what did they say in Acts chapter 1? This same Jesus whom you've seen taken up from you, the same Jesus is going to come back in like manner. The same one, the same way. Verse, four, verse 18. Because of this, comfort one another with these words. And then we go to Revelation chapter 3. So we're, we're going to bounce around here a little bit. But I just want to show you all over the Bible, the rapture is taught. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. God says, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation which will come upon the entire world to test those who live upon the earth. God says, I'll keep you from it. How's he going to do that? Exit. E.K. Out. Praise God. Revelation chapter 7, which we just read. Who are these? Where did they come from? Oh, they came from every nation and every kindred and every people and every tongue. And they've made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And now they're waving palms because they've come into the heavenly Jerusalem and they're greeting Jesus and they're falling on their face and they're praising God. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we're all going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. Hallelujah. Okay? And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I love this one. So turn to Thessalonians with me uh, right before Timothy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Is this exciting? Man, I'm telling you, we are going to go up. I don't know when, but I'm excited about it. And whenever we go, it'll be just fine. 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, starting with verse 5. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you about these things? Paul is telling the Thessalonians. Don't you remember when I visited your church, how I told you all about this? Don't you remember? Verse 6. And now you know what is stopping this, that he might be revealed in his time. Because the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who now lets will let until he is taken out of the way. Here's what Paul's saying. The Holy Spirit has got a hold on evil. But man, when he's taken away, 
the evil one, verse 8, the wicked one will be revealed. As soon as the Holy Spirit departs, why would he depart? Because he lives in us. And because he lives in us, he's going to go up with us. And when that wicked one is revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth, that's later in chapter 19, and shall destroy him with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And then look at Luke chapter 21, the book of Luke. Just, just, just want to show you all throughout the Bible. You can't put all these scriptures together and misunderstand them. Luke chapter 21, starting with verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Weather changes. See any weather changes? Okay. There will be distress of nations. There will be perplexity. You know what perplexity is? What just happened? What? Why would they even think that? That's perplexity. Wondering, this doesn't make any sense. The sea and the waves will be roaring. Verse 26, Luke 21, 36, or 26. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. For looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. Because the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then will they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. And he spoke to them about a fig tree and said, look at the fig tree in all the trees. When they now shoot forth, in other words, okay, most of our leaves now on our trees have fallen off. So in a, in a couple of two or three months, you're going to start seeing these little green shoots. That means summer's coming. Spring's here, summer's coming. That's all Jesus is saying. When they shoot forth, you know your own selves that summer is now near at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, you should know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away till all of this is fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So take heed to yourselves. In other words, be careful. Watch where you walk. Watch what you do. Be careful. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with uh, gluttony and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes on you unaware. Because just like a snare, it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. You are to watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Doesn't that just describe what we read in Revelation 7? And then look at Daniel chapter 12. We've talked about this before, but man, I can never hear this too much. I love to hear this stuff. Daniel's after the book of Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 12 right before Hosea. Daniel 12, verse 1. Now, Daniel 11 is all about the Antichrist coming to power. So you got the Russians and the Chinese coming to make war on Israel. you got all this happening. And you got the Antichrist just getting ready to come to power. Chapter 12 starts out this way. And at that time, at the same time, shall Michael, Michael is an archangel, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands up for the children of your people. And there will be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. So that's the great tribulation, God's wrath. But at that same time, your people will be delivered, every one of them that is found written in the book. Are you written in the book? Is your name written in heaven? You know, remember the song? There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. When a sinner comes home and receives Christ, his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. 
The Bible says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, like the stars, in other words. And those who have turned many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. And then look at the book of Zephaniah. Okay, so just keep turning to your right. And it's uh, before the book of Zechariah, and I believe after the book of Habakkuk. Zephaniah, right after Habakkuk. Or page 1282. (laughs) I love doing that. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, gather yourselves together. Gather, O nation, not desired. Before the decree comes forth, before the day passes like chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, so that it may be that you will be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. You say, well, that's an escapism doctrine. Absolutely. You know, go hide yourself. Where are we going to hide? In the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. How about Isaiah chapter 26? So you've got to turn back to your left to the major prophets. Isaiah chapter 26. Man, I had to study this a long time to find all these different scriptures that talk about God taking us out of here. Because there's so many people sharing that this this the rapture isn't going to happen. Just like there's a lot of knuckleheads right now that are saying God abandoned us and so did Trump and nothing's going to happen. Well, he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He said, I will help you. Fear not. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Fear not. That's Isaiah 41.10, by the way. Isaiah 26, verse 17. This is a heavy scripture right here. Isaiah 26. Everybody there? Okay. Verse 17. Like a woman with child who draws near to the time of her delivery. She's in pain. And she cries out in her pangs. So have we been in your sight, O Lord. Have we not all been like, how long do we have to be here for this craziness? How long will these wicked people continue to be wicked? How long? Okay, verse 18. It's like we've been with child. We've been in pain. We have, as if it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. You know what he's saying there. Nothing's happened. The wicked people are still wicked, and we're not delivered yet. Verse 19. God says, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body will they arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth will cast out the dead. Come, my people. Well, that's pretty clear. He didn't say Satan's people. He said God's people. Come, my people. Enter into your chambers. Shut the doors about you. Hide yourself as if it were a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. That's really plain. Isaiah 57. And verse 1. I had a good friend who I loved dearly. He moved to Oregon. He got cancer. 
he moved, they moved him back down here to Atascadero and he committed suicide. God understands mental sickness. He does. It was really sad. The guy believed. He believed with all of his heart. He just lost 100 pounds with cancer and couldn't deal with the stomach pain anymore. His stomach was eaten up with cancer. So he took his life. People were saying, I don't understand. We prayed. We prayed for him to be healed. I prayed for the Lord to take him. Why? Sep 57.1 The righteous perishes, but no man even lays it to their heart. And merciful men are taken away. No one even considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. I've had some really good friends who've died of cancer. And you know what I believe? I believe that God says, rather than let you go through more pain and more misery and more craziness that's going to come in your life, I'm bringing you home early. I'm not going to let you suffer anymore. I'm going to bring you home early. And I believe that with all my heart. That God loves us so much that He's not going to let us... Well, the Bible says so, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no test that has come upon you other than that which is common to man. But God, who is merciful, will also provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God knows our, our, our threshold. He knows how much pain we can take. And there comes a place where God says, that's enough. That's enough. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And, and again, you have these notes so that when people ask you questions about, is the rapture real? You got it all here on paper. And all you got to do is say, well, let's just read these Bible verses. See what you think. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Actually, let's start with verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of God's will, according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself, what's God's will? That no one perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. God doesn't want people to perish. He said, why will you die? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Thus saith the Lord. So, verse 10. So that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, in other words, in God's time, he might gather together in one all the, all the things in Christ, both which are in heaven and those which are on earth, even in him. So in other words, he wants to gather us all together. He wants to gather us all together. The ones that are already in heaven and the ones that are on earth, his. He wants to gather us all together in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who is working all things after the counsel of his own will. God's perfect time. God's perfect time. Luke chapter 17. So you've got to turn to your left. We're in Ephesians. You want to go to Luke. Luke chapter 10. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, starting with verse 30. Even thus it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. This is what it's going to be like when Jesus is revealed. That's what he's saying. Verse 31. In that day, he that is on the housetop and has his stuff in the house, don't let him come down to take it away. The one who's in the field, let him not likewise return back. Remember Lot's wife? Remember her? All she did was look back. And the Morton Salt Company became rich. Verse 33, whoever will seek to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you that in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other left. Now, the word men is in italics. Anytime you see something in italics, it's put in there for better understanding. Literally what the scripture says is there will be two in one bed. Okay, so I believe that's probably a man and a wife. One is taken, the other left. How many people do we know that the wife is saved, the husband is lost? Or the husband is saved and the wife is lost? The Bible says there's going to be a day when Jesus comes and if that other one doesn't get saved, one's going to be left behind, one's going. 
Verse 35, two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, the other one be left. There will be two men in the field. One will be taken, the other left. And they answered, where, Lord? And he said to them, wherever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Where? In the air. Where do egg- eagles don't run on the ground like chickens. They fly in the air. Amen? So where are they going to go? They're going to go up. They're going to go, you know, eagles fly way high. Buzzards don't fly that high, but eagles fly way high. Okay, and then uh, finishing this out, Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. You know what I love about this church? I, I really, to this day, have never seen anyone looking at their watch. I love that about this church. That you're, <laughs> you don't have a watch on. <laughs> I praise God for people who want to hear the word of the Lord. Man, I've been in some churches where it's like, could we be more demonstrative? The pastor can see you. And they're going. And all that, all that does to a preacher is, oh, pff, let's be another half hour. You know? <laughs> Any preacher that's worth his salt. Matthew 24 <laughs> I love, I love you guys. I really do. Matthew 24, verse 36. That's why I really do study hard. Because I want to bring God's word. And I want you to be fed. And I don't want you to leave here empty. I want you to leave every time with more than you could ever desire so you can share it with others. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no man knows. No, not the angels of heaven, only my Father. But just like the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, in the days of Noah, you guys, the the sons of God came into the the, uh, daughters of men. They were changing the DNA. That's what was happening. Giants were in the land. Every thought of men's hearts was continually wicked and evil. You think about what's going on in our land right now. Do you know who just got appointed to the health and safety position? according to the new guy who got in there by cheating, a transvestite. And I mean, it's unbelievable what's happening in our nation. But as the days of Noah were, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. It's here. It's here. Verse 38, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. We've talked about that. Marrying is coming together sexually. And they were with animals, with each other, whatever. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Until the day that we're caught up in the rapture, they're going to keep doing the same stuff. And the day we're all gone is the day they're going to freak out. You wait till the next two chapters. Verse 39, they didn't know. Until the flood came and took them all away. So it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. The same way. Then there will be two in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, because you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what watch the thief was coming, he would have been watching and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, be ye also ready. Boy, this is a heavy scripture right here. Don't miss this one. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man will come. I've had so many people tell me in Bible studies and other places, oh, pfft. You're you're such an extremist. He's not coming for a long time. We won't even, we won't see his coming. We'll, We'll already be in the grave. And I said, well, if you pay attention to the scripture, it says you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. That's a personal pronoun. That means singular, your Lord. What if he comes for you tomorrow? Then what? And then ending it out, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Thank you for your patience tonight. And those of you who are on YouTube. 1 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with verse 4. I believe we can take this scripture personally. Brethren, you are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. You are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, got to believe, and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Because God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we will live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and build one another up, even as you also are doing. Amen and amen. I would encourage you, if you're not saved, and I believe, well, I don't know people's hearts. So I'm just going to say this. If you're not born again, ask Jesus to come into your life. I did that on November 4th, 1980. I really didn't know the sinner's prayer. I just said, God, if you're real, come into my life right now. I surrender myself to you. I'm sorry for my sin. Forgive me. I believe that you're the Lord, but I want you to come in and prove it. And the next morning, I was, I, when I woke up, I knew I was saved. My whole life changed. So whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, don't wait. I've seen too many people wait and their life was taken before they made that decision. Amen. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Lord, we just rejoice that you are God. You are still on the throne and you are still in control. And we know that one day, we don't know when, only the Father knows. One day, you're coming to the clouds. You're going to blow that trumpet. And wherever we are and whatever we're doing, if we believe, we're going to be caught up into the clouds, into the air. And so shall we always be with you, Lord. So I pray you will help us to mark our days and mark our time and use it wisely for your glory. I pray you'll bless my brothers and sisters, Lord God. Bless us as we continue to look up to you. We trust you, Lord, and we know that you are our deliverer. We give you all praise, all glory, and all honor tonight. In Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 I just want to say one last word to those who might be listening on YouTube uh, before we shut this video off. Uh, you've heard the message, what about your loved ones? What about your family that doesn't know Jesus? What about your coworker, your friend? It's real easy to just hit the link, copy it, and send it to a friend and say, I want you to watch this. Let's talk about it after you hear it. Amen? Amen. All right. Praise God. God bless you.